I'm Leif Nelson, and I've got with me Dr. Christopher Martin from the philosophy department. And today we want to talk about ethics. So a couple of things I would say. First, uh, one, um, I would draw a distinction between uh, uh, ethics and morality. Um, so uh, ethics has to do with behavior. Uh, everyone agrees that there are proper ways to behave and improper ways to behave and uh, a third category of, of things that are questionable. So uh, we all probably agree that I ought to help uh, somebody in need or miss a request. Uh, we all probably agree that I ought not to uh, punch a uh, uh, leaf in the face. Um, we all probably uh, disagree on, uh, uh, let's say, physician-assisted suicide or uh, abortion is always a big ticket item, right? So, so there are behaviors that we ought to do, behaviors that we ought not to do, and behaviors that we have questions about, right? We have debates about. Um, that's ethics. Ethics is a behavior. Morality has to do with the uh, theory, the, the truth that underlies our behavior. So when we agree that I ought not to steal a candy bar, uh, we have a good question as to why. I ought not to steal the candy bar. We agree that I shouldn't do it, but why? What's the moral theory that uh, underlies ethical behavior? Right? What makes actions morally right or morally wrong? And that's where we have just an array of different theories. Uh, so what we're really asking for is, in morality, we're asking for the truth that underlies moral claims. Right? Why is it that? So that's what we want to um, look into. Do you want to move into some of those theories? Thanks. Yeah, let's look at some of the theories because I know that there are sort of different um, main schools of thought on, on how we can approach this. And, and in our readings, we looked at specifically um, Mill and Kant. And I know that those are sort of two big names when you're, when you're dealing with ethical theories. Um, but I, I know that you've got some more detail about how, how those two sort of thought leaders in, in ethical theory um, know, can really be broken down and compared to a lot of other maybe subtopics within those. Sure. Right. Um, uh, Mill and Kant are, they're awesome. They're excellent. They are, they are just great accounts of uh, morality. Uh, both of them um, have uh, intuitive appeal. They, they have a lot going for them. They're, those, are, those are probably the two best moral theories to consider, uh, at least, you know, as we wade into the waters, things get much more complicated. Um, but we, before we get into um, <clears throat> Mill and Kant, I think I'll back up and draw um, a broader uh, set of issues, and you'll see very, uh, you'll see uh, fairly shortly how Mill and, uh, Mill and Kant fit into this. So can I use the... Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start with a, with a, a very important question that, that everybody ought to ask themselves uh, seriously. And that question is, okay, does that come up all right on the screen? Um, I think so. We can make it bigger if you like. Yeah, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit on that. Sure. Um, zoom is... So, uh, we were asking this question, uh, are there moral facts? Um, is, is, is the world a place uh, wherein we find moral truths? Uh, so, we know that there are facts about the material world, let's say. The world is a material place, it's got handy technological gizmos, it's got human beings, right? It's got little markers, okay? So, the world has um, material truths about it. We, we might call these truths uh, descriptive truths, right? They are describing the way things are. So I can describe this room by saying there are two individuals in this room. That is a descriptive truth. It's true, and it's describing something. Uh, moral truths are prescriptive. So when you get a prescription, your doctor is telling you, you ought to take two of these uh, a day and call me in the morning. Okay, so moral truths are prescriptive. They're telling us what we ought to do. 
So when we say, are there moral facts, what we're asking is, in addition to the descriptive facts about the world, are there also prescriptive facts? Are there truths about the world that tell us how we ought to behave? Is it a truth about the world that I ought to be compassionate towards Leaf? Is it a truth about the world that I ought not to uh, steal? Okay, so are there moral facts is uh, really pushing this question of um, are there prescriptive truths about the world? Uh, and, and I think that, that one of the, and I don't want to jump ahead here, but one of the distinctions that, that I often think about with these issues is uh, if there are sorts of you know, laws about how to behave, is that something that, that really just exists in my own mind, that I think that this is the proper way to behave with sort of my own set of rules, or is it something that is outside of me that's, that's kind of universal that everybody should follow, we just need to discover what those truths are? Right, good question. So, uh, it, it, um, it gets, it's complicated. So, um, if there are uh, moral facts, then what you're saying is, this is a fact about the world. Now, there are two ways in which moral facts can be a fact about the world. One is, independent of human beings, independent of any action or any behavior, independent of any of these things, there are just these, these truths, right? Before human beings, before rational agents arrived on the scene, it was still true that we ought not to uh, take the life of another uh, sentient being. Okay, that's what it means to say moral facts are true. Um, a different way to say that moral facts are true is to say that these are facts about sentient beings. So this is where we get into some complicated issues. You say, well, you, you might say, well, I'm not really sure that the world outside of rational agents is a, is a place where there are these prescriptive truths. But it seems to be true for rational agents that we should help each other out, that we should not harm one another. So now we're giving a, a kind of a gray area answer. We're saying there are moral facts as they pertain to rational agents. Mm -hmm. So we have a shared set of moral truths. So, so by giving it that context that, that it has to depend on sort of, you know, being, you know, sentient beings, as right. you say, or, or even people, how far down can we take that argument? Can we say that there are moral truths, but they only apply to this particular situation that I'm in right now today, and it can't be applied to, you know, other factors that may come right. up with? Yeah, so, so again, we're, we're, we're getting into some really tough terrain here, which we'll, we'll come back to some of the simple theories in a few minutes, I think. But, you know, here's a, just a really good question. Um, a, a number of people who uh, seriously think about morality, um, a number of them, but by no means all of them, come to the belief that morality is not, uh, there is not a set of prescriptive truths about the, the natural world. Uh, so when you watch, you know, this is a different illustration, you watch the, uh, these uh, two seedlings growing up in the trees. And they're growing up side by side. Well, one of them is going to grow taller than the other. And in growing taller, it's going to expand its, its leaves out above the other one to, to suck up more of the sunlight. It's going to basically kill its neighbor, right? Because it's competing for the resources. It's competing for the sunlight. We don't think of that as murder. You know, we don't think that one tree kills another tree and that's some kind of moral wrong. Because that's just not a place where morality applies. But... You know, if Lee takes my parking spot, and I get out, and, and I run over him with my car, <laughs> sorry, we would say that that is uh, immoral, and that's wrong, sure, sure. right? So, um, so th there are a number of people who want to say that morality is uh, confined to rational agents, right? Leaf and I, we are uh, uh, moral agents. The trees, they're not. Here's just a really good question. What about our treatment of the environment. The environment is a um, probably uh, a non-rational agent. Okay? We can talk about that, but that's metaphysics. 
right? Um, but the, you know, the environment is a non-rational agent. We are rational agents. Are we doing a harm? Are we doing a moral harm when we hurt the environment? Or are we just making things really bad for us down the road? And see, that that's where we might be able to tie it back into things like mill and uh, the utilitarian right. argument is that, that when you get into these kind of economies of scale, that if you're if you're really trashing the environment, we know that that's harmful for other people. Right. And maybe um, causing less harm to the environment while not necessarily considering that a plant has some kind of consciousness and you shouldn't you know hurt that plant, but knowing that it helps to um, process CO2 and oxygen for other people to breathe, that's where we would consider the impact yeah. for, for other people right. and the benefits. Um, so can we draw a couple of pictures to, I think if we draw a, a picture here, this might help us to play some of these issues in a better setting. Yeah, absolutely. So, let's, let's focus on the doc can here. Yep. Okay, so uh, the original question, are there moral facts? Mm -hmm. Well, let's take... Um, the answer that is um, possibly, I think, easier, but this is, I, I would suggest, probably not a good answer, but let's say, no. There are no moral facts. Okay, well, if you believe that there are no moral facts about the world, you have to give some account of morality. You have to explain what morality is. And so you might say... Individual relativism, or you might say cultural relativism. Okay, so there are no moral facts about the world, but individuals can construct for themselves moral truths, or cultures or societies construct for themselves moral truths. There's a very funny uh, Calvin and Hobbes uh, <laughs> cartoon where Calvin and Hobbes are walking and Hobbes, or sorry, Calvin is basically um, espousing, arguing for an individual relativism, right? Mike makes right. He, he gets to do what he gets to do. And uh, his partner Hobbes shoves him into a big thing of mud. And so Calvin gets mad at Hobbes for shoving him into the mud. And Hobbes says, well, look, you're an individual relativist, so am I. And Calvin gets up and says, well, I only meant for me. Right? So, so uh, individual relativism uh, is, is, is sort of, it, it's attractive to a number of people, but it's probably not what you really think about morality. Yeah. You're probably not an individual relativist, um, if you really think about it. Uh, cultural relativism, a number of people will be... Um, uh, may be attracted to, but with cultural relativism, there are some big problems here. Um, one, do you want to accept that a cult? So, one, what is a culture? That's a big question. But, but two, if you have a culture, let's say the United States, right? Is the culture of the United States something that can uh, set, that can um, create moral truths? Can it do that? Then a, a third problem is, well, if it can do that then what do you make of people like the uh, suffrage movement for voting rights for, for African Americans or for women? They were challenging the moral norms of the culture. Were they acting immorally? So individual relativism, cultural relativism, uh, they have some um, uh, serious challenges uh, to them. But let's move to the yes portion. Are there moral facts? This is where things get a bit more uh, traditional. Yes, there are. Okay, so the world is a place where we find moral truths. Well, what, what kinds of truths are these? Uh, I'll just do three quick good theories to think about. Probably the three most popular. Um, the first one is Mill. Mill, utilitarianism. Uh, utilitarianism basically uh, defines morality in terms of consequences. An action is good if it creates good consequences. An action is bad if it creates bad consequences. So, Mill, utilitarians will say morality is determined by the consequences 
that an action produces. Yeah, and, and from my understanding, Mel talked about like our question of scale. Um, did he mention like what what consequences would have the greatest good for the greatest number of people or the greatest happiness? I guess right. Not how you framed it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's exactly what Mill says. The greatest good for the greatest number. And one of the challenges to utilitarianism is how do you um, measure that? Right. How far into the future should you look? You know, we have we there are a number of uh, limitations on uh, the scale of, of consequences. So. Um, what a number of uh, contemporary utilitarians have said is, well, we'll look at the consequences uh, theoretically or in the abstract and use these to come up with general rules. And so the rules that we have uh, for morality are dictated by the consequences, but the rules are still general. So we don't have to worry about the specific consequences. We don't really do that. I mean, shoot, you know, anytime you're in a grocery store, you can have some moral dilemma as to whether you think it is going to produce an eventual good consequence if you pay for your groceries or not. You know, maybe, you know, the person behind the cashier is a, uh, stealing the money to fund some terrorist organization, or how do you know all these things? How do you weigh all these possibilities, right? You can't really do that. So it gets kind of fuzzy, and I appreciate that you said it's a good general rule because it, it, it does get challenging when you think about, well, if I do something that benefits, like, you know, ten people, or I do this other thing that that um, you know eight people find really, really beneficial. Then how do I compare those two? Exactly. Uh, one of the biggest problems with utilitarianism is uh, slavery. On certain uh, formulations, I can produce a lot of good for eight people by enslaving two. All right? You get a group of ten people, and possibly the greatest aggregate good comes about. By enslaving two of them, and, you know it's complicated, but so so here's a scenario I just want to toss out and see see what you think a utilitarian might might say about this. Um, so let's say that you've got like uh, the Pirate Bay, which is a file sharing um, you know host that they basically provide an interface for people to go and download movies, for sure. example, and lots and lots of people get free movies, and they really like getting this free entertainment. Right, um, but there's what the film industry would argue is some harm to their industry. And so what would a utilitarian think about something like a pirate bay? Right, great question. Yeah, uh, a utilitarian um, needs to weigh the outcome, the consequences of the pirate bay versus the consequences of uh, making efforts to shut down the pirate bay, right? Sure. To, taking it off the web or whatever they would, they would do, right? Um, and so the utilitarian who supported Pirate Bay would want to make the argument that a world with Private Bay is a world that has ultimately greater, a greater outcome, greater consequences than a world without Private Bay. Or sorry, Pirate Bay, right? So you know, maybe, I don't know, you know, people are exposed to new ideas and new ways of thinking through movies they might have seen otherwise, and so ultimately these make us more moral down the line, and some such argument. Right, but the uh, same argument can be applied against Pirate Bay by yeah. saying, no, if you uh, allow this to continue and you are allowing people to download movies without paying for them, uh -huh. those funds that we pay when we go see movies go ultimately to the studios who make the movies. Without these funds, they can't make future movies, and so whatever value movies might have for the public is going to be lost yeah. because the funding source for them is, is considerably diminished. So do they get into, so this is where sort of the, um, the, the timeline of consequences may come into play. Right. Would, would a utilitarian um, lean more in favor of sort of instant gratification or immediate pleasure right. or what may be described as sort of hedonism that I get to watch this movie right now for free and just be entertained. Right. And, and I'm not going to consider the long term anybody. consequences of the film industry as a whole, I just want this immediate satisfaction. Yeah, um, uh, that would be a, 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 a bad utilitarian argument. <laughs> you know, so they, um, they would that consider would be, more long-term consequences? Right. Under, um, if, um, if you go back to individual relativism, uh, underneath here, uh, this is sort of a version of what's called egoism. <laughs> right, egoism, <clears throat> excuse me. In egoism, you generally have... Uh, Uh, 
unenlightened and enlightened, right? The unenlightened egoist is somebody who's going to say, I just care about me. I don't care about you. I'm not trying to look out for your best interest. Uh, you know, and, and that's all that counts. And unlike egoism, it's a bad theory. It's, 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 it's untenable, um, largely. Uh, the enlightened egoist is somebody who is going to say, well, in looking out for my interest, I'm also looking out for the interest of other people around me. So the position that you just described seemed like uh, an unenlightened uh -huh. egoist trying to hide behind a utilitarian theory, okay. um, but unsuccessfully. Because any moral theory uh, wherein there are moral facts, probably has to be impartial. So, what okay. you claim is a moral truth should be true for everybody. So you remove yourself from the equation. That's right. Right. And, you know, yeah. Um, How would an enlightened egoist uh, justify their consideration of other people if they don't think that there, is, that there are moral facts? Uh, again, excellent question. Uh, an enlightened egoist is going to say, um, uh, morality uh, is a product of the, of the way that I am designed, the way that I am organized, right? Um, I'm going to look out for my best interests. Well, my best interests are best achieved by having the other people around me do well or be treated fairly. I mean, imagine two cultures, each of them with uh, ten people, okay? The ten individuals in culture one are Unaligned egoists. Everyone cares only about their own immediate self-interest. Uh, culture two, ten people were enlightened egoists. They care about uh, the best, of the, the, the well-being of everybody else in their culture, gotcha. not because they genuinely respect all the other people, but because they recognize that if I cultivate a sense of fairness and equality within my culture, right. I'm better off down the line. So it's kind of like a self-preservation thing. Right. If I don't, you know, piss off all my neighbors, they're not going to attack me. And so, That's right. Uh, don't throw stones in glass houses kind of a, That's right. a, a right. approach. So. I mean, I do better when we all do well. Right. And, and it seems like there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, there are, there are hazy issues, but definitely. Great. But that's stuff. Um, do you want to go back to some of the other theories here? Yeah. Like three seconds. All right. So uh, I think it would be good to, to, to put some more theories on the board here just to give us a, a bit more context. So. Uh, we have, uh, there are no moral facts, and so we have some version of relativism. Uh, morality is a function of our choices. Uh, we have, you know what, there are moral facts, and now we have a very good question as to what, what underlies them, what, what makes them moral facts. And the first one we saw was, well, it's the consequences, right? Consequences are what make the moral facts. Um, Manuel Kant's. Uh, a very different thinker uh, from um, Nell. He has what's called deontology. Deontology. And uh, the basic uh, idea behind deontology is that instead of looking at the consequences for an action, there are, um, let's say, um, intrinsic moral principles. And those are universal, right? They're not yes. tied to like in each individual. These are something that would apply to everyone. Yeah. Uh, Kant said that these uh, intrinsic moral principles are uh, truths of reason. Reason itself, which is universal and impartial, reason itself um, produces uh, descriptive truths about the world, you know, the physical world, and prescriptive truths. So is it, 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 it is a... It, it is a matter of reason that, um, uh, you know, running over leaf uh, for taking my parking spot is, is a moral wrong. So it is true always and everywhere, and specifically um, in contrast to utilitarianism, it's true just because the act itself is, is wrong, right? Harming another human being is wrong, period. It doesn't matter who the person is. It doesn't matter what the consequences of harming that person would be, harming another human being is wrong. So if you were to go back in time as a Kantian, you had the opportunity to, to murder Adolf Hitler before the rise of uh, Nazi Germany, right? Oh, yeah. We would all be like, heck fucking yeah, uh, do that, right? But 
uh, Kant would say, no, right? Murder is wrong. If you were to murder Adolf Hitler, uh, it might, it, it would be a good thing, but it would still be a moral wrong. Okay, so so what it, what is the reasoning for not harming other people? I mean, how obviously he he would argue that you if you work through the the rational process, you come to the appropriate conclusion. And, yeah, and so so how how might he come to that conclusion? Um, not harming other people. I, 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 without, without considering something like enlightened egoism or utilitarianism. Right. Uh, in, in Kant's uh, grounding for the metaphysics of morals, uh, and then in his critique of practical reason, he attempts an argument wherein he claims to show... Uh, so here's one example, right? He, he calls it a, a lying promise, okay? Um, Kant says to promise to... So Leaf loans me some money for lunch today, and I say, Leaf, I promise I'll pay you back, okay? Well, um, suppose I know that I'm not going to pay you back. Right? I know that I don't have the money, and I'm not going to have it. But I lie anyway, because I, I want the money. Well, Kant gives an argument where he says, look, if you engage in a lying promise, and other people engage in a lying promise, then um, fairly quickly, the notion of a promise will uh, lose its meaning. If people are making promises, but really they know they're not going to keep them, then the very meaning of a promise uh, is negated. So the meaning of promise would become, I will pay you back, and I will not pay you back. And that is a logical contradiction. So reason would show us why a lying promise uh, cannot be made sense of, cannot be um, true. So his, so his, his uh, version of morality is based on really logical uh, yeah. Of trying to avoid contradictions to yeah, you know, it, it gets very complicated. Sure. Um, Kant's view is really hard to appreciate when you're working through it and learning about it because yeah. it seems very odd to think that reason can produce moral truths. No, but that's if that's where right. he's coming from. Then that then is where he says that, yeah. that you know that makes sense and obviously they're, they're, it's a very nuanced. Uh, framework that he provides, yeah. but, uh, but basically, if you come to the correct logical conclusion that, that doesn't contradict itself, then that would inform your moral action, right? Yes, and, and actually, too, I, one, one, one thing I know about Kant is you don't, so Kant himself relies on reason to make this claim that there just are bedrock moral principles. Did, did he have like a treatise at all, or like a list of sort of these are? These are kind of like my version of commandments of how people should behave, or... Yeah, Kant had what's famously called uh, the categorical imperative, which we know uh, somewhat as the golden rule. Okay, but the categorical imperative says um, any action that we could rationally will to be a moral law of everything, um, only so uh, any action that we could will to be a universal moral law is a moral law. Mm -hmm. It's a way of testing any moral truth. Mm -hmm. So for Kant, for any moral dilemma that you find yourself in, take your chosen um, reaction to it, the way that you behave. Which could you could you will that that action be a universal moral law in that context? Could you by reason will that? If you could, then. Gangbusters, you're off and running. Yeah. So, so the way I always tried to think about that was um, when you consider an action that you may or may not do, uh, what would happen if everybody did it all the time? Right. right. And so I think of this sort of trivial example of like littering, right? Let's say if I throw a piece of garbage on the ground, what if everybody did that all the time, that that was a, uh, a universal truth that everybody just did? We would be, we'd be living in a like a landfill everywhere we went. That's right. And so that's why it's probably not a good idea for for me to do it right now. And you, you, you could uh, update that to uh, the way that we treat the environment. Okay. Right? Quite possibly, we are uh, littering the environment with CO2, and who knows what being the consequences for that. Um, but yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing that, you know, so Kant, he's going to argue as a matter of uh, moral principle, actions are uh, morally right or wrong just because the actions themselves are morally right or wrong. That's in strong contrast to Mill, who's going to argue about consequences. So if you look at climate change, Kant and Mill probably would both agree that 
uh, polluting the environment is a moral wrong. So they're going to agree on the uh, behavior, right, the, the ethical behavior, but they will have a very deep disagreement as to the truth that uh, underlies. So let's think again about maybe file sharing. You know, uh -huh. one, one could consider that if lots of people get free songs, they're all very happy, and that could be kind of a weak utilitarian argument. Yeah. But Kant might say that if everybody downloaded songs all the time and nobody actually paid for them ever, the whole entertainment industry would collapse. And uh, right. It, it, oh, wait. It would be, it, or well, that would be a cons that would be consequential. Yeah, Kant. But he wouldn't consider that. This is where Kant is in trouble because it yeah. seems like it's really hard for Kant to uh, um, ignore consequences. Okay, so how, how can we look at that example of something like downloading files right. from a Kantian perspective? And that would be to say, um, the act of uh, downloading um, the uh, files yeah. would need to um, have some kind of inconsistency, some kind of logical inconsistency. So did, did Kant take into consideration like the current sort of laws that were at the time? I mean, do you, do you have, I mean, you know, is that a factor in his argument good, that if I'm violating, right. you know, my country's laws right now, then that's something that... Good, good moral theorists uh, do not take into account the laws of their um, country or of their time. Uh, so, you know, actually, for instance, a lot actually, of... and if we can go on a little tangent and hang on that point yeah. for a minute. So there is often, as, as we'll explore in this course, maybe a little bit of an um, incompatibility or disconnect, at least, between ethics and, and laws. Would, yeah. would you say that that, that can be true? So. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's it's good to uh, remember that, right, to, to, to think about that. Um, if uh, you are drafted into the army, you are told to, uh, you know, let's say go to war and, you know, kill uh, the enemy. Well, maybe you think that killing the enemy, you know, suppose you're thrown in Afghanistan or Iraq, and, and your own feeling is, I have no problem with uh, the Afghans. They've done nothing to me. It's, this is not like I'm hunting Al-Qaeda here. I'm hunting a member of the Afghan army, a member of the Iraq army, and I don't know that I feel morally right about doing that. Right. That is a legitimate moral problem. Or, or an even much, not to, um, not to minimize the example you brought up, but a much uh, uh, more innocuous example is when they invented margarine. Uh, they had the patent for margarine, but what the, the patent, um, or what the, uh, the federal court said when they patented margarine was they had a really strong um, dairy industry lobby. They said, you can't sell this for like eight years. Right. Like, this is a great invention, but you just can't sell it because we need to give butter enough time to strategize how they're going to compete with margarine. Yeah. So that's where the laws obviously didn't have the best interest of the public in mind. Yeah. But, you know, was it an right. ethical right. decision or...? <laughs> you know, um, it's true. It's, um, if you look uh, specifically at the, the history of the Supreme Court, a number of their cases, uh, if, you, if you read their uh, views, you can just... You can see the justices um, struggling with moral theory and the practical law and its practical reality in our world. You can see them struggling with, you know, this is, this is where the hardest work is done. It's easy for me as a philosopher to sit in my ivory tower and, you know, I'll put my cards on the table. I really like Kant's moral theory. Um, but you put me on the ground, you know, in, in this world and things get way, way, way more complicated than they did in my little uh, ivory tower. Um, and, and, and so that is a really exciting place to think about morality, especially margin or butter. I mean, it's, it's a perfect case in point. Uh, there's a lot of arguments to be made there, many of which are non-moral. You have economic arguments, you have uh, geopolitical arguments, you have um, two, all kinds of arguments that, that come into play there. So it's, 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 it's the real meat and potatoes of uh, Moral theory. And a lot of those probably do hinge on consequences, though, right? Where we yeah. can say, well, we can't even really take those into account. Right. And, and the problem is, we have, you know, on certain occasions, we have a deep intuition. We have a deep sense that uh, there's a moral principle at stake. I just feel deeply that um, being compassionate 
is uh, morally proper, regardless of the consequences. I feel that, uh, you know, I, I believe that, you know, murder is uh, wrong, regardless of the consequences. If I could, I would not say Hitler. I, I would kill Hitler if I could. But when I did so, I would feel like I was committing a moral wrong. Okay? Um, so, uh, but we also have a number of other instances where we think in terms of consequences. So the Robin Hood, steal from the rich and, and, and give to the poor. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, that's, that's proper. They have too much and he has too little and the consequences are good. So in, in that scenario, the consequences of thievery make it morally proper, right? So Kant and Mill, there are these two great contrasts in moral theory between or is it the consequences that determine the moral rightness or wrongness, or is it the uh, intrinsic characteristics of the act? And I'm going to uh, move to a third moral theory um, that some people think uh, promises to address some of these you know, issues here. This third moral theory is virtue ethics. Virtue ethics goes back to uh, at least Aristotle, Plato as well, but we won't worry about that. And the defining feature of a, a virtue ethics is that it says um, morality is not a function of the action, it's a function of the character. It is not my uh, running over a leaf with my car that is wrong, that is morally wrong. It is my character, my, my personality traits that are wrong. So morality is a function of the person, not of actions. Right. And if morality is a function of the person, then uh, what, what, Kant, or sorry, what Aristotle famously does, and remember he came way before uh, Mill and Kant, yeah. Aristotle famously says, that uh, the person decides how much consequences matter and how much intrinsical principles matter in a given situation. No, no, he was really kind of famous for trying to like categorize everything, right? Yeah. And he had like a spectrum of like personality traits that yeah. are more favorable than others, that you should be more brave than cowardly and right. sort of things like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He had, he had a you know, virtue theory, he had, he had the virtues. So, you know, you look at the virtue of moderation, you look at the virtue of uh, courage, you look at the virtue of uh, wit, you know, just being a good person. Um, there are, uh, the, the virtue of justice is obviously very important. So there are all of these uh, virtues, and virtues are basically traits, they are habits. Um, a good person is somebody who is in the habit of acting virtuously, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that gives us a sense of what it would look like. So, with Aristotle, we get a real nice um, contrast to Kant and Mill. Um, although, uh, don't let me uh, um, allow you to think that you know, Aristotle is obviously the right answer here, because with Aristotle, you have a whole host of issues about, well, one, what are the virtues? Because Aristotle gave us one set of virtues. Right. Uh, many, many, many years later, uh, Frederick Nietzsche comes along, and he says, yeah, Aristotle, this is a great way of thinking, but you got the virtues all wrong. Uh -huh. And so he gives us a complete difference in virtues. Okay. So there are a lot of deep questions that beset uh, Aristotle's view, too. But in terms of contrasts, Kant and Mill and Aristotle um, are, I believe, the three best moral theorists to uh, think about. Because they really do a nice job of drawing our attention to different aspects of morality. They all seem to capture something that seems to be right, or at least intriguing, yeah. and they all have deep problems. Great.